Minnesota's Lakes at Risk is a co-production of TPT's Minnesota Channel and the Minnesota Lakes Association. Additional support for this program provided by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Welcome, I'm your host, Kim Carlson. Minnesota's lakes are at a critical juncture. They are changing and in some cases degrading rapidly. Most of the changes are due to increasing shoreland development. It's what we do on the land that affects the health of our lakes. The good news is that there are many things that we can do to solve this problem. It's up to us individually as landowners and collectively as citizens and governments. If we act now, we can protect our lakes for the enjoyment of generations to come. Minnesota is rich in lake resources. With 208,000 miles of shoreland, we have more shoreland than the states of Florida, California, and Hawaii combined. Lakes define who we are, what we do, and our quality of life. Let's think about lakes for a moment. What is it you value about your favorite lake? Is it catching a lunker or taking the grandchildren fishing? Going for a swim on a hot summer day? Spending time with family and friends boating? Watching wildlife or listening to the call of a loon? Or is it enjoying the beauty of a lake landscape? And your income may depend on clean lakes. Lakes represent the good life in Minnesota. Lakes define our natural and cultural heritage and represent a legacy for future generations. In many areas of Minnesota, lakes are the engines that drive the local economy. Tourism is a $9 billion industry in Minnesota. And while lakeshore prices continue to escalate, taxes from lakeshore accounts for only a small percentage of the income to lake communities. The real economic benefit is the dollar spent on these lake visits. These dollars can circulate throughout a community eight times over. For example, dollars spent on lodging, food, bait, sporting goods, gifts, gas, and recreational services all help support a community. As you will hear from our guests, everything that we value in lake country is driven by the lake's water quality and habitat for fish and wildlife. It's time to find out what's happening on our shorelands and how better land use practices, regulations, and personal actions can protect the future of Minnesota's lakes. My first guest is Paula West, Executive Director of Minnesota Lakes Association. Paula, what's happening on Minnesota's lakes? Well, Kim, up until about the 1920s, you know, Minnesota's lakes were largely inaccessible to most people. But then we got better cars and better roads and cabins started appearing on our lakes up north and that tradition of going up north began. But in the last 25 years, we've seen some very dramatic changes on our shorelines, primarily due to shoreland development. Those cabins with tree-lined shores that attracted people to the lakes for many years are now being replaced with more suburban-type homes that have manicured lawns to the water's edge, and that can have very serious consequences for Minnesota's lakes. Another concerning trend is the development of the sensitive marginal shorelands of shallow lakes and shallow bays of larger lakes. These areas of our lakes are often teeming with cattails and bulrushes, which are beneficial to the lake. They're spawning beds for fish, but they're very sensitive to even small changes in pollution amounts. Kim, our shorelands are changing in Minnesota. With most of the priority lakeshore already developed, these shallow lakes and shallow bays are primarily what's left to develop in Minnesota. Paula, with most of the good shoreland being developed and the marginal shoreland now being taken, what does that mean for Minnesota's lakes? Well, Kim, it means changing our expectations. When people build a larger home, whether it's seasonal or recreational, their expectations of what that shoreland should look like changes. It's different than when they just went up there for the, the weekend. They want to see a more manicured lawn, and often they want more services from the local community. Um, they sometimes think they can convert that shoreland into what they consider to be the perfect lake lot with sandy shores and a nice beach and good swimming and no weeds or what we call aquatic plants. Um, and they start trying to mess with Mother Nature and there can be very serious consequences to the ecology of the lake when we start doing that. So are these changes likely to continue? Yes, they are going to continue as lake country continues to be developed. 
The north central region of Minnesota, which includes the Brainerd Lakes area and surrounding counties, has grown 25% between 1990 and 2000 and is projected to grow another 60% by the year 2030. And the popular lake regions around Alexandria, Fergus Falls, Detroit Lakes are also going to grow another 40%. And even southern Minnesota, where the lakes are very fertile, is experiencing pressures from shoreland development. So what's the bottom line here? What do these demographic and development patterns mean for the future of Minnesota's lakes? Well, the time is now to make right choices. As individuals and as local governments and state governments, we cannot wait another 25 years. It will be too late. The choices that we make today are going to impact the enjoyment of lakes for future generations to come and the economies of many communities in Minnesota. You know, development itself is not a bad thing. It is inevitable. It's how we develop, where we develop, and how much we develop on our shorelines that's going to make the difference between whether we protect them or whether we harm our lakes. As individuals, we can change our habits and how we manage our shoreline, but local officials in particular have very difficult decisions to make now in planning for shoreline development through their local ordinances. And state agencies have a responsibility to provide guidance as well as the resources that local governments need. We need to get beyond just looking at the short-term property tax gains that the increasing shoreland values bring and see that making protective choices now will protect the value of those shorelands in the future and our clean, healthy lakes will bring tourists coming to our communities for many years to come. Now we'll talk with Julie Westerlin of the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. Julie, tell me why shorelines are so important. Kim, lakes are among the most diverse ecosystems in the Midwest. And of all the plants and animals in that diverse environment, more than 90% of them make their home right here along the shoreline. So the shoreline really is a special place. Undeveloped shores have a variety of trees, shrubs, grasses, and aquatic plants, as well as things like dead trees, rocks, and other habitat that host a rich community of birds, fish, mammals, insects, turtles, frogs, and other critters. And how is development affecting shoreline? As the shoreline is developed, we're seeing sharp declines in the kinds of habitat I just described. The prominent trends on lake shores is what I call the suburban lake lot. Things like dead trees, which provide tremendous habitat, are the first to go. Then native vegetation is replaced by plants cultivated in nurseries, which have little habitat value, and lawns, which are often mowed right down to the water's edge. Kim, ecologists refer to Kentucky bluegrass as a habitat desert because very few animals can find the food, shelter, and nursery areas they need to make a living. Rock retaining walls go up because the shoreline is eroding away without the native vegetation. And the reeds, cattails, and other beneficial aquatic plants are replaced by blankets of sand, which again offer little or nothing in the way of habitat to all those animals that rely on the shoreline. Most people don't make these drastic changes intentionally, it's just that more and more people are living at the lake. And they've taken the suburban landscape mentality with them. We've been conditioned that when we live in a place, we mow the lawn and keep everything neat and manicured. But that's in direct conflict with the way nature intended shorelines to be. And folks don't realize the unintended negative consequences of their yard aesthetic. I'm here with Paul Radomski. Paul, tell us what you do. I'm a research scientist with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and recently been studying the effects of uh, shoreline development on fish and wildlife. So what, what are these studies showing? Well, they're showing that the effect of development is having a decline in fish and wildlife populations due to habitat loss. For example, the conversion of forested shoreland to more suburban type of shoreland means the loss of, of trees and shrubs and these losses of habitat relate back to the birds that are living along the shore. For example, you're getting more common birds like grackles and what's lost is the uh, warblers and vireos. In addition to as you lose those trees, um, those trees aren't available to fall into the lake. And, and research has found that those, that tree falling into the lake is very important fish habitat. And scientists have shown that the loss of those trees in the water um, will affect fish populations for centuries. And this is, these are subtle and insidious changes of, of habitat. Also, uh, with development, uh, when you change the shoreline from, from natural vegetation to lawn right to the shore, 
It also affects other wildlife populations. For example, green frogs. Male green frogs establish their territories within two feet of the water. And the removal of that vegetation removes their habitat. And what we found is that at about 30 homes per shoreline mile, the, these green frog populations disappear. And that's a subtle thing. All of a sudden, a, a, a wildlife species is no longer present. And there are also subtle changes that we never expected. For example, biologists studying crappie nesting along shore. Who would have thought that most of the crappies were nesting away from developed shore? They studied three lakes in the Alexandria area, and only 24 of the about 900 crappie nests were located near developed shoreline. You ask why, why is that? Well, crappies, as it turns out, were nesting near bulrush. And over 90% of the crappie nests were located adjacent to bulrush. And bulrush is a very sensitive aquatic plant that, uh, that gets damaged with recreational use or people actually pulling or destroying it. So, Paul, are the fish dependent on the shore? Yeah, almost all species of fish in Minnesota are dependent on the shore at some time in their life history. For example, northern pike, it spawns on last year's emergent vegetation. For example, this bulrush off this point here. The, the, the northern pike spawn on that and the eggs adhere to that bulrush and they hatch there in 14 days or thereabouts. And then the young northern fry, has, uh, which doesn't have a functioning mouth, has a sucker on its top of its head and it uses that sucker to adhere to vegetation along shore. And it'll stay along shore in the vegetation for the full, full summer. And it uses that for cover for, so it doesn't get eaten, of course. Um, and then there's other species like, like walleye. They spawn in very shallow water on gravel, or windswept shores, um, often just in two or three inches of water. And they need very clean gravel shoreline. And shoreline development, if it increases sedimentation or um, nutrients entering the lake, which would, which would bring algae, those would suffocate the eggs that are laid in that very shallow water. So, Paul, what's happened with aquatic vegetation and this increased shoreline development? Well, we've been studying that, both looking at how development affects it and comparing it to undeveloped shoreland. For example, a couple years ago, we flew color infrared photographs over 44 lakes in north central Minnesota. And we found, by comparing developed and undeveloped shoreland, with development, we found a 66% loss of aquatic vegetation on average, which is really, we were really high. We didn't expect it to be that high. Julie, it's obvious that we should be very concerned about the loss of shoreline habitat that comes with development. Are there other impacts of development that we need to worry about? Absolutely. The impacts of development on shorelines tend to be the most obvious and the most distressing, but equally important and sometimes more important is what's going on in the lake's watershed. A watershed is simply the entire area of land that drains to a lake, river, stream, or wetland. And what we do on the land, even if it's miles away from the lake, can affect the lake's water quality. When it rains on a natural or undisturbed watershed, typically about 50% of that rainfall soaks into the ground. Roughly 40% is taken up by plants and evaporated, and about 10% runs off to our lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands, becoming surface water. As development around the lake and in the watershed happens, the land is disturbed and vegetation is replaced with hard surfaces like roads, houses and other buildings, and parking lots. This drastically changes the way water flows across the landscape. In a developed watershed, we now see only 15% of rainfall soaking into the ground where it belongs, and now 55% is running off the land to our lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands. So what kinds of pollutants are found in runoff? Well, there are a number of pollutants of concern. In lakes, we're most concerned about sediment and phosphorus. Kim, vegetation is the skin of the earth, and when we cut the skin, the earth bleeds. It bleeds sediment. Sediment clogs aquatic habitat, muddies the water, and most importantly, the sediment particle acts like a vehicle, carrying other pollutants such as mercury, bacteria, and nutrients along with it to the place where it finally settles. Phosphorus is the other major pollutant we worry about in lakes. There was an experiment done in a Canadian lake where scientists divided the lake in half by hanging a curtain from the top to the bottom. They added carbon and nitrogen to both sides and phosphorus to only one side. The phosphorus side turned pea soup green with algae. 
and we're seeing increased growth of algae and aquatic plants in many Minnesota lakes due to increased loads of phosphorus from a variety of sources in the watershed. And only one pound of phosphorus can feed the growth of up to 500 pounds of aquatic plants and algae. Development in the watershed affects lakes too, but how much do lakeshore homes really contribute to the water quality problems? Well, Kim, on the undisturbed shoreline, there will always be some baseline amount of runoff, sediment, and phosphorus, which is perfectly natural. On a lot with a primitive style cabin that has minimal land disturbance and a small footprint of hard surfaces, there's only a slight increase in runoff pollution. But from the suburban style lake lot, which is typical of today's development patterns, there's a five-fold increase in runoff, six times more phosphorus, and 18 times the natural amount of sediment getting into our lakes. So if I'm a lakeshore owner, do I need to worry that the runoff pollution from my lot will ruin the lake? I mean, does one home really make a difference? Kim, the only way one house would not make a difference is if you had the only home on the lake, but that's hardly ever the case. We're concerned about the idea of what we call cumulative impacts on lakes. Let me give you an analogy to describe what I mean. I just planted a garden in my backyard. Let's say my four-year-old, Jack, runs through the garden once. Probably not a lot of damage. Now let's say Jack and 20 other four-year-olds run through the garden. I've got a big problem, right? But if I go back to Jack and ask if he destroyed the garden, he's a smart kid. He'll say, no, Mommy, we know just one kid does not wreck the garden. Well, it's the same with lakes. It's the small actions of the many that combine to make one big effect. And once we see the cumulative impacts of development, it may be too late because restoring lakes is far more difficult and expensive than keeping them clean and healthy in the first place. Paula, what can Minnesotans do to help make sure that we keep our lakes clean for generations to come? Well, Kim, there's three ways we can protect lakes at different geographic scales. First, at the watershed level, local governments, whether that's the county or the city or the township, must proactively plan for shoreland development. And they need to pass good local land use and shoreland ordinances, and then they need to enforce them. And water quality is determined by what happens on land. And planning and zoning are two of the most important tools that we have to protect our lakes. At the neighborhood scale, good site design and stormwater management can help reduce runoff to our lakes. And then finally, at the lot scale, homeowners can do a lot to keep our lakes healthy. So what is the one best thing that a lakeshore homeowner can do to protect their lake water quality? Reducing erosion and preventing runoff to the lake is the most important thing that homeowners can do. Keeping their shorelines natural or revegetating their shorelines both in the water and on the land will help prevent the pollutants from running off into the lake. Natural lakescaping is becoming much more popular as people begin to understand what the benefits and the beauty of natural shorelines are. Carolyn Helber lives here on Fish Lake in Maple Grove. Carolyn, you've changed your lakeshore from a regular mowed lawn to native landscaping. Tell us why you've done this. We had a lot of problems with geese, first of all, and so when we looked at doing it, one of the things that we wanted to do was to eradicate the geese as much as possible. One of the things that we found out from lakeshore restoration is that the geese won't come into an area where they think something might be there trying to get it. So we have eradicated the geese, or they go to our neighbors on either side and visit. We also wanted to control the erosion on our lakeshore. We have a lot of wave action here on Fish Lake, and we wanted something that would control and keep the land that we've paid for. Carolyn, how would someone who wants to put in this native vegetation get started? It's really easy, and it's uh, something that everybody likes to do. Quit mowing. Just don't mow the area that you think you might want to put into native vegetation. The area will come with its own seed beds. It's amazing what happened with ours. We had sedges and beautiful wildflowers that came up on their own. Someone at the DNR told me that some of those seed beds can last up to 100 years. So when you don't mow an area, you can really see what comes up there naturally. Was this an easy decision for you and your husband? <laughs> uh, no, actually not at all. My husband was really resistant, did not want to do it at all. He perceived that it would be looking like weeds in the lake. 
I guess it took a while for both of us to come to the conclusion at the same time. When we did, it didn't take long for us to be able to get the planting done. Our neighbors on both sides have been interesting. One neighbor, actually when we first started, the neighbors weren't real big on the idea. I think everyone perceives it as being something that will be wild and not pretty. So our neighbors on this side have since, in the last five years, decided that they would like to do the same thing. Our neighbors on the other side have a sandy beach that they just put in a year ago and it's already washed out. So we're starting to see that the benefits are great both to us and to the lake. So what does your husband think about it now? Well, interestingly, he now brings people down and shows off the beautiful flowers and the butterflies and the songbirds. So I think it takes everyone a different amount of time to accept something like this. Kim, there are a number of things that we can do to minimize the amount of runoff and associated pollutants that come off of hard surfaces like parking lots and streets. One of the great tools that we have available to us is called a rain garden or a vegetated swale. And these can be used in parking lots like this where we have a raised island that really doesn't do anything for us. And turning that into a, a depressed area that's vegetated and has soils that are specifically engineered to handle stormwater runoff coming into it. These serve a number of benefits for us. First of all, the roots of those plants can help the water soak back into the ground where it belongs, and they can also take up contaminants like heavy metals into the tissue of the plant, getting it out of the environment. And there are actually bacteria in the soil that can break down motor oil and other pollutants. Kim, we've got a great example of these vegetated swales at the HB Fuller Company parking lot in a suburb of St. Paul. They installed these swales and monitored the runoff coming from the parking lot. They found that they were able to reduce runoff and phosphorus by over 70% and sediment by 94%. So we're able to see substantial reductions in runoff pollution just by treating the raindrop as a resource instead of a waste product. Now Kim, it's important to remember that we don't always need to use infiltration where water's soaking into the ground because in some areas, soils just don't allow for that. But by exposing the stormwater and the pollutants to plants and soil, what we call biofiltration, we can have tremendous benefits in the way we clean up our lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands. So Julie, how can we encourage the use of these stormwater practices? Well, Kim, we can tell people about how effective and important they are, but it really winds up being in the hands of the local officials who can mandate the use of these practices through their stormwater ordinances and other regulations. Julie, are there other things that homeowners can do to help keep our lakes clean? Sure, there's a couple of really important things. First of all, if you have a septic system, make sure it's properly maintained. Have it pumped out at least every three years, and more often, if you use a lot of water. Another really important thing is to practice lake-friendly lawn care. Because of the way our neighborhoods are designed, many urban and suburban lakes are directly connected to the streets and their watersheds through the storm drain system. That means every street is a shoreline. So keep your leaves and grass clippings out of the street and out of the lake and choose zero phosphorus fertilizer. It's the law in Minnesota. And finally, limit your use of pesticides and clean up after your pets. Catherine McLean is a county commissioner in Itasca County where tourism and lakes are important to the local economy. Catherine, what is the role of a county commissioner in protecting Minnesota's lakes? We have to balance economic development and try to protect the environment at the same time, and that's a big challenge for local officials. But you know, we need to make tough decisions right now if we want to protect our most important economic assets, our water resources. Comprehensive plans, for instance, protective ordinances that are enforced can ensure long-term economic prosperity for everyone. And to be most effective, elected officials must work with citizens so, so that there's that partnership between private entities, public entities, individuals, and businesses. There's tough choices to be made, but these decisions are usually easier to make if we base our decisions on scientific data and long-term economics. And we're also more likely to gain and maintain citizen support from well-informed citizens if they understand that ordinances are meant to protect their investments. Why is it so important that citizens get involved at the local level? Well-informed citizens can be effective when they communicate their own experiences with Lakeshore Ecology to their appointed officials. And they can provide the support they need to us when we're up there trying to make the right decisions to protect our water resources and habitat. And then afterwards, they can hold us accountable to both enact and enforce 
ordinances that will ensure future economic prosperity and quality of life. Thanks for joining us. Lakes are a public asset. They belong to everyone in Minnesota. Ultimately, the quality of our lakes is a reflection of how we take care of our land. The less we disturb the land around a lake, the better the water quality. The healthier the water quality, the better the habitat for fish and wildlife. This all adds up to better fishing, swimming, and enjoyment of our lakes for years to come. Remember, it's what we do on the land that determines the health of our lakes. Lakeshore owners must responsibly manage their own shoreland. The community must make good decisions that promote healthy lakes. And local officials must do their part by setting and enforcing good policies for shoreland protection. The future of Minnesota's lakes is in our hands. Will we hear the call of the loon? Will children catch sunfish off the dock? It really is up to all of us to preserve the great legacy of Minnesota lakes. The shoreline tells all about the water, what there is to do, what there is for you. Without habitat, without vegetation, nothing can live. The lake will be through. Minnesota's Lakes at Risk was a co-production of TPT's Minnesota Channel and the Minnesota Lakes Association. Additional support for this program provided by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation.